Hey kids, welcome back. It is time for chapter 8, wrapping and taping. I can officially say I have never, in my almost 20 year career, tried to teach someone how to wrap online. So, uh, this could be interesting. Ideally, in a perfect world, we'd have plenty of time to practice, plenty of time for me to give you feedback, but unfortunately we can't do that. So, my goal for today is pretty simple. It is to explain the basics to you to teach you a little bit about the different types of materials that are available and show you some of the techniques but uh, in no way shape or form should you think that watching this lesson is going to prepare you to be well equipped to tape or, or wrap an athlete that takes practice and it's not an impossible skill to learn by any stretch it's it's actually relatively easy but it takes time it takes repetition so if you are pursuing athletic training as a career or physical therapy as a career then use this lesson as a jumping off point but by no means is it the end uh, it's literally just the beginning uh, I love this picture this is what baseball players do when they have too much time uh, they created tape outlines in the uh, infield and on the the BP net there so um, we can certainly use tape and wrap for more productive things than that. So let's get started. It's Friday. Uh, tomorrow's a game day for Tech, so uh, pretty excited about that. We've got 55 slides to get through, uh, so I will try to keep this as succinct and clear as possible. But uh, looking forward to a good weekend. So now, if if you've worked with athletic trainers in the past, you know that taping and wrapping is something that we do. Now it's decreasingly so and there's a good reason for that. Uh, bracing, taping, wrapping have been around for decades and have been used uh, throughout the years for just about any possible condition. Uh, the techniques are used to minimize swelling, provide support to injured areas and help prevent injury and the research has, has really shown us what's effective and maybe what's not as effective and that's part of the reason we've sort of trended away from it in in the recent past because the evidence would tell us that it's probably not as effective as we once thought so these skills are not difficult to master but they should be applied by the AT okay we need to understand the anatomy we need to understand the biomechanics and in order for the tape job to be comfortable and effective we really have to understand the sport we have to know how our athletes going to be moving how our patients going to be moving so that we can provide them with optimal support as I said the evidence would tell us that taping by itself really doesn't provide us with a lot of added support especially after the first 10 minutes or so uh, it is still widely used uh, ankle taping probably being the most prevalent if you were an athlete you probably had your ankle taped at some point um, what we were discovering is that structurally that's true okay if, if I were to take a cadaver ankle and tape it and and test it through repeated movement and this has actually been done I would see that over the span of the first few minutes that tape job loosens up and structurally speaking it doesn't provide a lot of added support however it still does provide some additional benefit because that skin that, that tape forming to the skin adds uh, input into the proprioceptors that could be beneficial in ensuring that the muscles that stabilize the ankle joint fire as as soon as they need to if I step off the curb if my proprioceptors are active and doing their job then my perineal muscles will fire and pull me back to neutral and that's what I want that's what I'm looking for but we do know that braces are are more effective than taping in many cases and the nice thing about it is any athlete can apply a brace when they're taught to do so uh, if it loosens up during participation you can just slip your shoe off if you need to and tighten it up tighten the velcro straps tighten the laces there are countless variations of tape jobs and everybody seems to ascribe to their own favorite way so uh, that said there are better ways and worse ways of doing this but it's rare for me to tell a student who comes in with experience that the way they're doing it is just downright wrong I'm 
I don't know that I've ever said that, but I've shown them some alternatives, some variations that I've used that work for me. Uh, wrapping is beneficial during recovery, in particular for uh, minimizing swelling or treating swelling that's already occurred. Uh, it needs to be firmly applied while still allowing circulation. We can use this to cover open wounds, we can use it to hold on a compressive pad or a protective pad or provide extra support. You've probably all seen ACE bandages. Uh, bandaging can also contribute to the recovery of injury. So usually with wrapping we're talking about a non-adhesive tape. Usually with bandaging we're talking about something like a triangle bandage. Uh, again non-adhesive. Uh, this can be firmly applied while again still allowing circulation. We can just like with wrapping, use this to cover an open wound, secure a compressive pad or a protective pad, or provide extra support. Uh, probably the cheapest material we can use for wrapping and bandaging is gauze, and this can be sterile, it can be non-sterile. Roller gauze is readily available. Uh, this can be used to hold dressings in place. Uh, something like this is a roller bandage. Uh, we can also use gauze pads as added protection. If we've got a hot spot coming up from a blister, then maybe that's something we can use. Cotton cloth wraps, we use these for ankle wraps, um, sometimes called rodeo wraps, or insert your team name here, raider wraps, or wildcat wraps, or whatever. It's basically just a, a non-stretchy, non-adhesive cloth that we roll up and we can use that uh, repeatedly. They need to be laundered but they can be used more than one time. Uh, triangular bandages, we find these in first aid kits. Uh, cravat bandages, same thing. Cohesive elastic bandage, this is kind of the newest, latest, greatest. Uh, it's now been out for a decade or more. Uh, Powerflex is the brand name that you'll probably hear most often. Coban is another. If you're in nursing, you'll probably hear it. Uh, this is a bandage that's cohesive, which means it sticks to itself, but it doesn't necessarily, if I were to put it on my shirt, it wouldn't stick to it. But if I were to wrap it around my tie, it would. Um, it's a self-adhering bandage, but it won't leave a sticky residue. Now elastic bandage, usually an ace wrap is what we're talking about here. These are usually elastic, uh, cotton elastic. They come with these little metal clips and I usually tell students once you tear the wrapper off, throw it away along with the metal clips. Uh, for an athlete who's going to participate, that's a, a, a cut hazard for sure. We would use elastic on or uh, uh, power flex to adhere that as opposed to these metal clips that, that could either come loose and cut an opponent or come loose and cut your athlete. Uh, these range in single widths, which are usually about the size of your hand, to double width, which are uh, twice as long. And they're, when you roll them up, they're considerably bigger. Um, typically, we're talking a 4-inch or a 6-inch uh, size range. Um, for something like a hip spica that we'll talk about in a minute, we would use a 6 inch wide double length wrap. For something like a shoulder spica, we might use a 4 inch double length wrap. If we're wrapping a gauze pad on a forearm, 4 inch single would be fine. So it just really depends on what you're using it for. These should be stored rolled up. Uh, these can be laundered. They'll come in a big wadded knot. You'll have to pull them apart and roll them up but we want these to be as flat as possible because wrinkles cause blisters and uh, those skin irritations are really not necessary if we know what we're doing. Okay, we want to hold that bandage in our preferred hand. If you're lefty, hold it in your left, righty, hold it in your right. Um, it's kind of like the, uh, the toilet paper question over or under, um, but generally we want that coming from the bottom of the roll. So if, if I were to hold that bandage, Hang on just a second. If I were to hold that bandage, I would want the the end closest to the patient to be at the bottom. That way I'm not wrapping over the top. We always want to anchor this, so we overlap the wrap by itself. Same holds true for tape. Uh, the wrap won't anchor itself out in open space. So we start at the smallest circumference. If I'm wrapping a shoulder and I've got to go around the chest and around the arm, I'm going to start and finish on the arm. Same holds true for the hip. If I'm wrapping around the thigh and the hip, I'll start on the thigh and I'll end on the thigh. 
Okay, um, we want that body part wrapped in a position of maximum contraction. So for instance, if we're wrapping around the arm, we want them to contract their bicep. If we're wrapping around the ankle, uh, usually it's tenderness, so we don't have to be concerned about that as much. Uh, but anywhere we've got a lot of muscle tissue, then we want them to contract just so that when they do contract, it's not going to be uh, constrictive. Uh, we want more turns with moderate tension uh, instead of fewer turns with maximum tension. It's, as we're applying an elastic bandage, if we overstretch it, it will be very compressive and it'll be uncomfortable. Okay, we want those turns to overlap by half. We'll look at pictures of that in a minute. And then once we're done, we want to look at circulation. So typically we're going to check capillary refill. If it's red and we press it and release it, it'll be blanched and white and then it will re-perfuse uh, and be red again. Okay, We can do that same thing at the foot. Okay, so several different types of elastic wraps we can use. Uh, ankle and foot spica. So this will be a four inch single length wrap. It fits in the clinician's hand here. Um, some other things we can do is uh, a spike. Anytime we see that term spica, we're usually talking about a spiraling figure eight. So we'll do a, a hip spica and a shoulder spica. Um, a general groin support, elbow figure eight. So lots of different techniques we can use that we'll look at here. So something like this would just be a simple foot and ankle spica uh, where we're going to wrap around the foot and then around the ankle and then around the foot and then around the ankle. And so you see how we're overlapping by half. We can do the same technique with tape, but we're going to tear that tape with every lap. Okay, Something like this we might use for shin splints for a calf strain if we're just trying to provide some added support. So you notice we start at the smaller portion of the limb wrap around, overlap half, and then once we get to the top we secure it so we've got a nice compressive wrap there. Groin wrap we said, or hip spica, uh, we start on the thigh, we end on the thigh. Okay, So we start here, wrap around the thigh, come around back, around the hip. You see the wraps here, we're just basically going to dive down through the groin, lap around and again. So you see we're just kind of continuing this figure eight pattern, thigh, hip, thigh, hip. So you see how it looks here. Um, looks like he's about out of wrap there and he's going to end on the hip. So if that's the case, I would basically just let this last little half lap loose, lay it around and tape it so that we're not trying to tape out on the hip. It's, it's not going to hold. It's going to come loose. Okay, Here's an alternative technique that we might use for uh, an adductor where, again, we're going to anchor that wrap to itself wrap around back and then down across front, around back, down across front. Here you see a wrap that might be more for a glute or a hamstring where we're going to pull tension down around the buttock. See how they're going to start on the thigh, around the back, around the front, dive around the thigh. So we just continue that figure eight pattern um, on the back side primarily. Okay, we can do the same thing at the shoulder. Uh, I will tell you this wrap technique is used 99 times out of 100 to secure an ice bag or secure a hot pack if we need to, as opposed to actually support the shoulder. So we start on the humerus, wrap around, then we go to the chest and wrap around. So we continue that figure eight pattern. Okay. For the elbow, we can do a figure eight wrap, basically just starting on the forearm, up to the upper arm, down and around, down and around. Okay, triangular bandage. Honestly, we don't use these in athletic training. They're in your textbook. This is a first aid uh, bandage or a first aid tool that we would use most of the time. Uh, if we don't have a roller bandage available, if we don't have a sling available for an injured shoulder uh, or arm injury, then we would use this. Okay, It's very versatile. We can use it for a number of different things depending on how we apply it. Okay, So here we see cervical arm sling. So this triangle bandage is going to have one long end and then two shorter ends. It's a triangle. It's an isosceles triangle. So we take one of the ends uh, off of the long end and drape it down on the non-involved side. 
then we fold that opposite corner up and over the neck and then we tie it around behind the neck and then we tie off the elbow to keep it from sliding out the back okay now in this circumstance this patient's arm is a little lower than I'd like usually we're going to want that up bound to the chest if we can if it's an elbow dislocation and we're not trying to move that then we're not as concerned about getting it up but getting it up tends to make it less likely to to uh, deviate from the body okay so this will be a sling this is not a swath though um, in order to swath that we actually have to tether it to the body so we can take another wrap uh, take it around and that will actually bind it to the chest Okay, a commercial sling will do much the same thing, but uh, we don't have to worry about tying it in knots. It's Velcro adjustable, super fast, super easy. So you see that sling and swath method using an ace bandage. So we've got the commercial sling, and we're swathing using an ace wrap. Okay, we will use this for a dislocation or a fracture a lot of times because it's an effective way of immobilizing that injured body part against the body itself. Alright, now two different primary taping techniques we use, non-elastic and elastic adhesive taping. Historically we would use what's called white cloth non-elastic taping um, for most of our tape jobs. Elastic adhesive taping, uh, we call that Elasticon. Um, PowerFlex is elastic but it's cohesive so it's a little bit different. Um, this is not as important as it once was, quite honestly, in athletic training. When I first started, uh, that was one of the skills we really wanted to learn because we did it all the time. And the evidence has told us that it's probably not as effective as we thought it was. It's still an acquired skill. It's a skill I enjoy having. Uh, it's, it's effective and beneficial. Uh, if nothing else, even if it's a psychological benefit, there's some benefit to it for a lot of athletes. Okay, so non-elastic white tape uh, comes on these rolls, inch and a half is most common. Um, cases like this sell for about 65, 70 bucks, depending on where you buy them. Uh, Mueller is another brand, it's a little cheaper. It's just like anything, you can buy more or less expensive brands. Um, some of the things we look for in tape, uh, Johnson & Johnson Zonus is kind of considered the gold standard. It's it's what most people would use if budget weren't an issue. And we're going to look at some characteristics uh, as to why. Some of your off-brand tapes aren't as easy to use because of these qualities. And we're going to look at each and every one of those. Okay, so first thing is the grade. Tape is graded much like sheets are graded. You look at thread count on a sheet, tape is much the same. It's graded according to the number of cotton fibers per uh, vertical and longitudinal inch. Okay, uh, The more fibers it has, the heavier it is, and therefore the stronger it is. Okay, So some of your cheaper off-brand tapes are a lesser grade. It's like using a 200 thread count sheet instead of a 600 thread count sheet. It's not as in that case it's not as smooth and comfortable. In the case of the tape it's not as as rigorous. It's, it, it won't withstand as much force. Second thing we look for and and honestly tape grade is you almost have to really scrape the bottom of the barrel to find tape that is not similar grade. That isn't usually the thing that makes the biggest difference. Adhesive mass and winding tension are. So adhesive mass tells us how sticky it is and how consistently sticky it is in the case of winding tension. Um, we want the tape to come off the roll but we don't want it to be uh, so weak that it doesn't stick to the patient. By the same token we want it to be sticky enough that it provides support but not so sticky that it's hard to get off the roll. Okay. Another thing we look at here is are there any skin irritants. Uh, historically this product had natural rubber in the adhesive and with so many people developing allergies to latex uh, it could cause some problems. So uh, hypoallergenic tapes are available and for some athletes you may have to use those or they'll break out in a rash if you use it. Okay, winding tension tells us how easy it is to get off the roll from start to finish and how consistent that is. Uh, J&J is pretty consistent from the very first piece you pull off the roll all the way down to the core. Some of your cheaper tapes they're really loose 
at first and they're really hard to get off at the end and what ends up happening is as you're doing your tape job you, if you don't adjust for that it's depending on where you are on the roll that's how tight your tape job is so it's loose and baggy if you got a fresh roll and it's too tight because if it comes off hard you put it on hard it's just human nature elastic adhesive tape kind of comes in two different varieties um, the brand I use most often is called J-Lastic. It's just a specific brand name, J-Bird and Mice. There are other brands available. Kramer and Mueller both make their own. And then, so that's more of a lightweight elastic. And then the real heavy stuff that we use for things that need a lot of support but they still need some, some stretch uh, is called Elasticon. And there are off-brand versions of that. That is also a Johnson & Johnson product. Um, this stuff too comes in a variety of widths. Most often uh, I would use like a three inch elasticon for something like an Achilles tendon tape job. Okay, to prepare for taping we want the skin to be clear of oil, lotions, anything like that that keeps it from being sticky. So we can wipe them down with alcohol if we need to. Make sure there are no cuts and scrapes before we do that. Um, hair should be removed if at all possible so uh, typically we would have a, a pair of electric clippers where they could just buzz it off or some disposable razors um, if they don't want to mess with that then we can just pre-wrap but just know that the tape job may pull this pull the hair and it may not be as as tight and it may get loose faster if they're particularly hairy tape adherent it's almost like hairspray it comes in a uh, an aerosol can. We just spray that on there, let it dry. That will assist in keeping that tape job from falling apart quite so fast. Uh, we also use foam pads to protect the uh, Achilles tendon as well as the anterior aspect of the ankle and then skin lube which is like a Vaseline. It's a uh, petroleum jelly type substance that lets the tendons in the ankle slide under the tape job. We use that to minimize blisters and skin irritation. Okay, ideally we want to tape directly to the skin, but day to day that's probably not the best option. Uh, that's going to lead to uh, skin irritation over time. So instead we use pre-wrap, it's just a, a roll of thin foam. Um, we want it as thin as possible. If we wrap the pre-wrap on layer after layer, then uh, you know we spray them down and then we wrap the pre-wrap on. But if we put multiple layers, we're not spraying in between so that foam can slide over itself. So the thinner we can get it, the better that tape job is going to hold up. So a case of pre-wrap, uh, I believe 48 rolls, 45 bucks, about a buck a roll. Some other things we want to have available, um, we already said disposable razors, soap and water, alcohol if we need to, uh, adhesive spray, sometimes people call this QDA, quick drying adherent, pre-wrap, heel and lace pads to protect, like we said, the tendons below. The white, that's our Zonus j, j tape, the elastic adhesive. Uh, we also have some felt and foam material available. If they've got a blister, we can pad around it. If there's, you know, a bruise, we can protect it. You know, we can uh, add to that tape job for added things. Um, one thing that's not on here is band-aids. We said if we're going to wipe that thing down with alcohol and they've got an abrasion or a cut, then uh, we want to cover that scrape before we uh, start cleaning away. So you see an example of an ankle tape job. Okay, so first, and I've never seen an athletic trainer shave an athlete. They do that themselves if they're going to do it. They're either going to shave themselves or they're not going to shave at all. Okay, um, apply tape adherent, let it dry. This is a heel and lace pad. Then we see pre-wrap over the top and then we see anchor strips. Okay, so uh, they're getting ready for an ankle tape job right there. First thing we got to do is select the proper tape width. Inch and a half is like the Swiss Army knife of tape. Uh, we can use wider for a larger foot or a larger, larger body part. If it's smaller, we can use smaller widths. Most athletic trainers will stock inch and a half. They might have a little two. And if they need narrower than that for some of our finger or thumb tape jobs, we'll just split that tape longitudinally and it'll tear so that we can get half inch or one inch. Okay. 
Uh, first thing you got to learn when you're taping is how to tear the tape. Uh, something like Elasticon you have to cut with scissors or sharks, some sort of tape cutter. Pretty much everything else you should be able to tear on your own. If you fold that tape over on itself and form a double layer, you're better off just to move on. You're not going to get that to tear. So here you see proper technique. Pinch between the thumb and the index finger. Pinch between the thumb and index finger and either pull those two apart or twist those two away from one another. Okay, so some rules here. We tape them in the position that we want it to be stabilized. Overlap by half. If we don't, that tape tends to split and when it splits, then we get a blister. Okay, We don't want continuous tape. We want to lap once and tear. Lap once and tear. The uh, only exception I would say to this is when we learn if you were to learn HELOCs and figure eights, doing those continuously is actually better and it's faster and it's more impressive because that tells me that you know how to lay the angles just right. Where a lot of people mess up in taping is they'll tear the tape, they'll set it down and then they try to place it and then they pick the tape up and they and so keep that tape in the hand whenever possible. Okay, Smooth it and mold it as you go and follow the contours of the skin. We always want to start and stop tape on itself, not just out on the body because it won't stick, especially if it's just pre-wrapped. If I put pre-wrap around my wrist and I uh, tried to pull away from it without lapping that tape over itself, it's just going to tear. Okay, So I always anchor tape to tape. Um, when I want maximum support, I don't use pre-wrap. Okay? We also don't want to do tape jobs if they've done modality treatments they've used ice bags or heat packs or whatever we want them to be uh, close to normal temperature. Okay, removing tape can be tricky. Um, we can just disassemble it if need be, but in some of our tape jobs where we kind of basket weave it together, that can be tough. So scissors or sharks, tape cutters can be beneficial. Um, and then we may also have to use some tape remover if the adhesive is sticking to the skin. Then there are uh, commercially available solvents that will help get that adhesive off. Okay, so ankle taping is the one we use most frequently. Um, it can be effective in reducing ankle sprains and giving some mechanical restraint, but it does lose its initial level of resistance pretty quickly. It gets loose fast is basically what that means. Um, without question, bracing is superior to taping in terms of mechanical stability. Uh, probably the best approach might be a good, well-fitting tape job with a brace over the top of it. Uh, because the tape gives us the added proprioceptive input, the brace gives us the added structural input. Now there is some concern if, if athletes always participate taped and braced, uh, then they're really not developing the musculature and ligamentous support uh, from playing. So. There's some debate there. There's not really a right answer. You just have to decide what's best for you. But I would say for any athlete who has a history of ankle sprains, taped and braced is going to be your best approach. And then do preventative maintenance rehab uh, away from practice. Okay, so our typical closed basket weave, sometimes called a Gibney tape job, um, we see strip one and two. These are our anchor strips. And then we do what are called stirrups and horseshoes. And we just alternate those. Uh, we're going to pull these from medial to lateral in most cases because it's usually an inversion sprain. Inversion meaning their feet roll so that their heels face one another. Uh, so that the soles of their foot rather face one another. So that's inversion. Uh, we want to tape them into neutral or even a little bit of eversion. Okay. So anchor, anchor. We'll do two or three proximal anchors, two or three distal anchors. And then we will do three sets of stirrups and horseshoes. And then this shows closing up all the way. Not many athletic trainers do that. We might do a couple of strips just to lock this down. And then we'll go into what are called figure eights and heel locks. And then we'll close it up at the very end. Okay, an open basket weave, I can honestly say, oppose, as with the exception of class, I have never once used this tape job on an athlete or on a patient. Uh, the idea here is to provide a little bit of added support while also not trapping swelling uh, if they have an acute injury. 
Um, I would much prefer to put them in some sort of elastic wrap or even put them in a walking boot as opposed to this. But if you, if you hear the term and you're curious as to what it is, that's what it is. There's no figure eights, there's no heel locks because to do so would prevent this channel from remaining in the front. All right, moving to the arch, there's really two primary arch tape jobs that uh, you can learn. There's actually a third, but I won't go over it today. Uh, the first is called the arch X, and what you see here is we'll do an anchor strip on the metatarsal heads, and then uh, a series of strips in an X pattern. So this is actually a teardrop here. I didn't have a good picture of an arch X tape job. So the reason it's called an X is because we're going to start on the first metatarsal head, we're going to wrap around the foot, and we're actually going to end on the fifth. So kind of like you see here, um, so that it looks like an X on the sole of the foot. Uh, so we'll go first to fifth, and then we'll just kind of overlap half and keep doing that so that we're trying to tape that foot in an arched position. Once we get that taped with three plus strips, we're going to close it up, pulling white strips up through the arch, and then we're going to wrap the whole thing with PowerFlex. An alternative is called the arch teardrop. So that's actually what we're seeing here. If we look at this single strip, it goes first metatarsal to first metatarsal. This one goes fifth metatarsal to fifth metatarsal. We would also have a third metatarsal to third metatarsal. So we would do that process one to one, three to three, five to five, and then go the opposite direction, five to five, three to three, one to one, and then close up. Okay. For most athletes, they tend to prefer that arch teardrop because it tends to be flatter. As you might guess, that arch X tends to pile up right in the sole of the foot. Uh, it's not as comfortable. So uh, usually if I'm starting to tape an athlete's arch for the first time, I'll start with this teardrop tape job. All right, turf toe. This is a, a pretty common injury in a lot of athletes, not just football players, not just those that play on artificial turf. But what happens is, uh, and the reason this got its name, is because athletes who played on turf, their their foot would basically interact with the playing surface. And instead of just falling over and sliding like they would on grass, they fall over and then their foot gets forced into this hyperflexed uh, position. Um, hyperextended position, rather. Uh, so what we do with this, we use these little T-strips, wrap around the toe, and then pull them down into the arch and then lock it up. So you see this illustrated with tape, or we can use, these are called moleskin strips. Uh, they're non-yielding, non-stretchy. So that toe can basically just get to neutral, and it can flex, but it can't extend. Okay. Buddy taping, we'll use this on fingers and toes. Basically, if we've got a sore or sprained toe, we just tape it to the one adjacent to it, and it provides some added support. Achilles tendon taping, this is a tape job using Elasticon, that tough elastic tape I told you about that we have to cut with scissors. We'll apply anchor strips, proximal and distal. Then we'll apply that Elasticon strip to the sole of the foot. We'll pull it up onto the calf, split it in half, and wrap it around. So you notice how that's torn, and then lock it down with white tape. Okay. So basically what this does is it, it spring loads the foot into plantar flexion on where your toe is pointed. Okay. Uh, because that Achilles tendon doesn't like to get into deep dorsiflexion with the toes up toward the nose. Uh, so this tape job is is useful for that purpose. Now a lot of times you'll have an Achilles tendon and an ankle tape job. So you start here and then you actually have to tape them in a little bit of plantar flexion. Now those are the main taping techniques I wanted to share with you that are kind of traditional. There's some some newer ta taping techniques that are worth mentioning. You may get asked the question. Those are, I, I look through the, the uh, thread of discussion and a lot of students are interested in uh, rehab and uh, as such these tape jobs may be even more beneficial than the more traditional ones. Research is ongoing I will tell you there's no definitive evidence uh, that I've come across at least that says without question these techniques work exactly as the theory says but 
lots of clinicians use them, lots of athletes swear by them, so I'm of the opinion that we at least owe it to ourselves to learn about them. Okay, so the first is called McConnell taping, and this is useful for patellar tracking issues where the, the kneecap doesn't glide superior and inferior like it should. So with McConnell taping, uh, the clinician uses a special adhesive uh, uh, backing tape, so it's kind of a papery white tape, and then McConnell tape is really tough and non-elastic at all. Okay, so in this case, the clinician is pulling that patella. You notice the labels here, medial and lateral. He's pulling that patella medial. Must be a tracking problem in the lateral direction. So by pulling it medially, we're encouraging it to glide medially. Okay. Another technique, here's a superior medial McConnell tape job. And this is where maybe the, the vastus medialis is deficient. So we're basically activating it. We're assisting it with this tape job. Okay. Upper extremity, a couple that we use here. This is called a, an elbow uh, hyperextension tape job or a check rein. Uh, basically, we just have a piece of tape that we've doubled over two or three strips and then we lock it down proximally and distally. Let me do that again. Proximally and distally uh, so that the athlete's elbow can't get into full extension. Uh, if they've got a an ulnar collateral ligament injury, if they've got a joint capsule injury that may be painful so this tape job would, would prevent that. Okay, Here's an alternative. Instead of a linear arrangement this is kind of a an overlapped X pattern that accomplishes the same thing. You'll see plenty of wrist tape jobs. Cheerleaders do this one. People doing max reps on bench press do this one just to stabilize the hand. These are just circular patterns over the wrist. As I said, it's better not to do lap after lap after lap for the sake of circulation, but I've certainly seen athletes do it. So keep that in mind. Thumb spike a tape job. Uh, here you see either linear strips or these half spike strips. Where we're going to start on one side, lap around, stop on the opposite side. Okay, so the point here is usually we're trying to stabilize this metacarpal phalangeal joint. Uh, rarely are we trying to stabilize this uh, uh, inner phalangeal joint. Remember the thumb has just two phalanges, so there's not a proximal or distal interphalangeal, it's just an IP joint. We talked about finger bu or buddy taping in the toes, an alternative to that in the hands is what's called a check rein, and here's where we don't actually tape them together, we add a little space, and where I've seen this used most often uh, is in basketball. You get someone who's got a thumb sprain on their shooting hand, we can't buddy tape their thumb to their to their index finger, but we can make almost like a web or a net that keeps that thumb from getting pulled uh, in a uh, in a well out of normal range, but it's wide enough that they can still catch the ball, shoot the ball, those kinds of things. Alright, last one here, if, if you've watched, it seems like beach volleyball, this is particularly uh, prevalent in a lot of the Olympic athletes, you'll see uh, when, if you watch the Olympics, we'll use kinesio taping. This was initially developed in Japan, and it's been widely used throughout Europe and Asia and made its way to the U.S. Uh, much like we talked about with regular taping, the, the benefit of this is thought to occur with the neurologic system, but kinesio taping, unlike white taping, actually has some stretch to it. So there's also a circular, circulatory system benefit. Uh, much of the theory behind kinesio taping, as you might guess, since it originated in Japan, is very similar to acupuncture, acupressure, where the thought is we can get an, some sort of impact on the circulatory systems and even the lymphatic systems. So this taping is intended to provide a constant tension on the skin. Okay. Uh, this can be used immediately after injury. We can use this during rehab. We can use this preventatively. Uh, it is used to reduce swelling or edema. It's used to treat pain. It's used to either inhibit muscles that are overactive or facilitate muscles that are latent. 
Uh, it's very popular if you look around, especially in professional sports, but there's just really not a lot of evidence. So that's not to say that it doesn't work, it's just to say that the science hasn't really told us one way or the other just yet. Okay, um, So we've kind of already touched on this, so the idea here is that it repositions joints that are out of slightly out of position by relieving that abnormal tension. If it's a, if I stretch it tight and stick it on, it's applying tension. Okay, so that might activate a muscle that is underactive. It's latent. Okay, uh, if I apply it on the opposite side, it's actually uh, trying to get that muscle to relax. Okay, so. I want to apply that tape from origin to insertion uh, on minimal tension so that we get muscle support. Okay. During rehab we apply it from insertion to origin. Okay. We put that muscle on a little functional stretch and then tape it. And that can be worn for a few days. It's usually latex free. There's a heat activated adhesive so once we put it on, on the skin then it sticks. If you just try to peel it off the roll it's not very sticky. Uh, it is pretty pricey, uh, several dollars per roll, and it does require specialized training. So I'm not even going to try to walk you through how we do kinesio taping. I just wanted to kind of talk about it. If somebody finds out you took this class and they ask you about tape jobs that you see on beach volleyball players or uh, other athletes, you'll at least know what to tell them. So here's an example. This will be a plantar fasciitis. So here we've got uh, an irritation typically right at the uh, base of the heel. So these strips are applied with light tension. They're elastic strips, um, so they're they're placed on stretch and then placed on the skin. So that essentially tells that skin it needs to be shorter is, is basically the input that it's giving it. And then it's locked down with a an anchor strip. Here's an example of a patella femoral, so this would be an alternative to a McConnell technique where we're actually stretching it in one direction, but you, you get the idea that it's it's still similar. It's, it's external material attempting to pull that kneecap in a particular direction, and by putting this in contact with the, the skin, it is sending input into the underlying musculature via the brain. Okay. This is the one you tend to see on the on the beach volleyball players a lot. They have shoulder pain, so you'll see these tape jobs where uh, trying to activate the deltoid and as well as the um, upper trap. All right, so like I said, this is not ideally how I'd want to do this. In a perfect world, we get a chance to pull out the tape and we'd practice now. But in lieu of that, I hope you at least understand a little bit more about the basics of taping. And if you have any questions, uh, there's no shortage of instructional videos. Uh, your textbook actually offers quite a lot of pretty helpful videos that you can look at if you are so inclined as to learn to tape. Um, if that's not enough, then most clinicians are more than happy to help you as well. So find an athletic trainer, find a physical therapist who's willing to show you the ropes and get a few rolls of tape and just practice. All right, well, that's it for today. Uh, I will see you next time.